Good afternoon, class. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today is, I believe, week number 15. This is topic number 13 in your curriculum book. So if you have a curriculum, make sure you pull out topic number 13, or you flip to that page, and we're gonna get started. It's page number 75, page number 75. So let me pray and we're gonna get right into it. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let this word come alive. Father, I pray their eyes be open to see, their ears be open to hear, their hearts be open to receive the word of life, the spiritual seeds sown deep within us. Father, let it produce in our body, in our mind, our will, and our emotions transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us into the image of Christ, growing us up into the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, class, if you didn't remember what I said last week, this is my favorite lesson. Out of all of the lessons that we teach in our discipleship program, this by far is my favorite. This is my favorite for a lot of different reasons. Um, when I was in college, we taught a class called Life. It was through the church that I was a part of. They call it Freedom Now, if they still call it that. But what it was about is living out of the tree of life, living in freedom, living out of the abundance, that Garden of Eden relationship with God. And so, what we're, so this is one of my favorites for that. But the second reason is I believe if you have a misunderstanding of the first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1, 2, 3, if you have a misunderstanding of those three chapters then you will miss the rest of the book in the perspective of who God is because the first three chapters are fundamental in understanding the heart of God why did he do it how did he intend it to be why did he do certain things in the garden there's so many specific things that God did that throughout the entire church age has been mistaught in a lot of different ways. People have drawn conclusions and assumptions that are just completely false. And so, with a misunderstanding of the nature and the character of God from the start, you see him differently through the rest of the book. So today we're going to go, and this is going to be a lot of verse-by-verse -verse stuff. I mean, we're, we're pretty much going through the entire, or we are going through the entire chapter 2 and the entire chapter 3. Chapter 2 we're going to take in sections, and then we're going to have that break point and then go into chapter 3 where we are going to go verse by verse. So we're going to get right into it. We're going to take no breaks today. We're going to just go right through it. And then at that break, when we move into chapter 3, if you need to use the restroom or get a drink or a snack, just hit the pause button, do what you got to do, come back. But we're going to go right through it in class so today let's start we're going to just go right into it in the curriculum book like i said we're on page 75 we're in genesis chapter 2 i'm gonna be talking a lot about pretty much just the curriculum i'm not gonna have a lot of additional resources this week because obviously the curriculum's over eight pages long um, with a lot of information on it and most of what we need is in the curriculum i will reference other things but a lot of that we will not be having in the additional it will mostly be in the curriculum so please make sure you pull up the answers the answers will be online after class so that way you can go through and get all of this because I know this is a lot of information so Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 6 thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So in Genesis chapter 1, you see all of the creation, or the creation. And then in chapter 2, it picks back up, and it says, it's finished. So what does it mean that God rested? He had rested on the seventh day from all his work. Now, God's not tired. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that God is tired. So we need to understand this. When it means rested, rested is Strong's H 
76-73 Sabbat. It means to cease, desist, or rest. It means God ceased. He finished in a way that it did not need any more work. It was done. It's like a painter painting a painting. And if he puts one more brush stroke, then it would ruin the whole thing. So he, he puts his paintbrush down. Andrew Walmack gave that example. I think that's a perfect example. But it means it's finished. It's complete. God rested. And th this is a, it's a good thing to understand that this is what happens in Hebrews chapter 4. Where it talks about that there still remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. That New Testament mindset of we enter into the Sabbath, which is what happens right here, where God ceases from his works because it's complete. The completion of what Jesus did on the cross, I'll put that in the notes. That when Jesus finished his work, it was done. It didn't need any more. He completed it. And that's the same thing that God's doing here in chapter 2. He's ceasing because it's done. Now, why did it mist instead of rain? This is a point we need to hold on to because it didn't rain until Noah, which shows the faith of Noah when he built the ark because for, what was it, 70, 80, 100 years? I think it was, I think it was 70 or 80, where Noah was building the ark and it hadn't even rained. People didn't even know what rain was because it hadn't rained yet. And Noah was still building arcs. That shows the faith of Noah. We're not going to get into that today. But I just want, to, I want you to see this so you don't miss it. Remember, we're looking at all these little details out of these two chapters today. We're not looking at chapter 1, but chapter 2 and chapter 3. There was no man to till the ground. So there was no man to work the ground, cultivate the ground. So that's why there was no, there was no rain. It said, And God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So God's holding the rain back because there was not a man to till the ground. But mist, and this is something that you need to understand, mist goes up onto the leaves and it's what keeps plants alive. Rain will also water the soil and cause them to grow. So there's a difference between the mist. Mist is keeping all of the, the life alive. So the, the earth could have been sustained because of the mist because it was keeping it alive. But when it rains, it's causing a growth. Everything is going to now grow up even greater. But if there's nobody to work it, it's going to be an 80-foot tall, dense forest with nobody to till it. So that's why both of those. And these are just little details that I don't want you to miss. So you can understand it was mist, not rain. It's little details like this that will help us really understand these two chapters. Let's go on to the next section. We're going to read two 7 through 15. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of, the, went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is which, that is, it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah. And there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. And there is Bedlam and the ox stone. And the name of the second river is Gion. The same as that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Helica, which is that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. Now knowing these names specifically of these rivers is not a huge point. And that's not what we're looking at of these, these eight verses. But I, want, I do want to look at this. How did God form man? So it says that God formed man from the dust of the ground. And then he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. So God spoke creation. God spoke the heavens and the earth. God spoke light. God spoke water. But he formed man. And if you know that in John chapter 15, let me write this down, that God is the husbandman. God is the vine dresser. 
And we talk about this in our daily teachings, so this would be a good reference point if you're um, following along with us on our daily teachings. I know we are in our fall semester of 2022, so that's you have to go back and look at October 10th of 2022 to see the daily teaching we're working on. But John 15, the father's the husbandman, and we learned that when we were watching Stuart Graves teach, he explained that the husbandman, the vine dresser, is very integral in the soil, the seed, and the vegetation. So God forming man out of the dust, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So where did God put man? In the Garden of Eden that he planted. So God put him in the Garden of Eden. This shows the intentionality of God to put him in the garden. That's important to understand. Like, God didn't just form man to be servants. God formed him, and he put him in a garden that he planted. Now, what grew out of that garden? Every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. What two trees were in the garden? The tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so both of those trees were in it. What did the river do? The rivers were watering the Garden of Eden, bringing the life force into it, the water. And before I answer this last question, I just want to throw a couple points out here about this section. So God formed man out of the dirt. And if you look at uh, Mark chapter 4, not the parable of the sower, but the parable that comes afterwards, it says... I want to read this to you, church. I'm going to bring in all these extra points today. I wasn't going to, but it looks like God wants us to see some other things. So I'm going to bring some of these other points into this. Because this will shed some light on some of the things we've already talked about. Mark chapter 4, verse 26. So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Bringeth forth fruit of herself, the feminine, uh, the feminine part of speech. It's not a male part, but a female part. So the, the ground, the soil, produces of herself by the activation of the seed. The seed tells the ground what to produce. Now you might say, why is this such an important aspect? Because you are, as I believe it was Charles Capps maybe that said this, but you are dignified dirt. That's what you are. You were formed out of the dirt. And God's way of doing things is that the seed, the sower soweth the word, Mark 4, 14, the words that you speak activate the ground. Your heart, when we talk about your heart is your soil, that's the ground. You have to cultivate your heart with God so that your soil will be producible, that your, your soil of your heart will produce. This is what we're talking about. Because God made you from dirt. And the way in which God created the earth to produce after its own kind is the same way that your heart produces when you speak the word of God into it. When you, when you can make your confessions, when you speak the word of God, when you speak in faith and act in faith, all these things are dealing with the fact that you, you are dignified dirt. Your body goes back to the dirt. And that's powerful to understand that your words have power in your body because you come from the same ground and the same principles that God said. I just wanted you to see that, church. That aspect of you being formed from the dust of the ground. But I want you to see that that aspect of God being the husbandman, he is very integral into the process of the dirt, the soil, and then him breathing the breath of life. He breathed himself into us, which causes us to be a living, uh, living creature. And that's also in John 15 where it talks about abiding in the vine. If you don't abide in Jesus because Jesus is the life-giving force, he is what allows us to have life. And that's very important to know. Sorry, church, my nose was itching. But, so let's answer this last question. What was man's job in the garden? So God put him into the garden Eden to dress it and to keep it. 
Now we need to understand that these are two different words. And as we talk about this all the time in our church, I'm going to say it again. If the Bible uses two different phrases, that means there's two different meanings. They are not two different phrases meaning the same thing. Almost never does the Bible do that. It's always two phrases with two different meanings explaining the whole, you get a whole perspective when you understand both. So we don't say dress and keep it, oh, Adam was just in there to take care of the garden. No, it's deeper than that. To dress means to work or to serve. Now that's talking about pruning, you know, you got to you gotta keep it up. It's, it's, we're talking about working the garden. As, as a gardener, you have to work your garden for it to produce fruit. So Adam's job was to dress it, but his job was also to keep it. Now, keeping it means to keep, guard, observe, or give heed. So Adam's job was to protect the garden and to keep it up and to dress it. So he's got to do some work in it, and then he's got to protect it. I want you to not miss that point, that God put him into the Garden of Eden to be in fellowship with him. Because remember, God planted the garden. It shows the intentionality of the Father to be in relationship with Adam. That I want to be in relationship with you, so I planted a garden where every tree was pleasant to the sight and good for food. I planted it. It was my intention. I wanted this, and I wanted to be in relationship with you, so I, I'm the one that caused these things. So don't miss that. This is very, very important that you understand that God wanted this. God's whole plan from the beginning was relationship with man in the garden. And it was man's job to dress it, to work it. And we're not talking about working it in the sense of tilling the ground. We'll show that. That's part of the punishment. But, but working it, just to serve in it. To serve, to serve as, a, as a gardener in it. As the father is the vine dresser, as the father is the husband, then we're going we're gonna to work alongside him, serve the garden, keep it up. And we, we can't say keep because the other word keep means to, to guard it. We're talking about Adam's job was to protect the garden along with uh, serving in the garden. So I want you to understand both of those. Verse 16 through 17. Let's go on to the next section. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Out of every tree, out of, every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So, what commandment did God give man? Now, we got to understand, at this point, uh, these are little details I don't want you to miss. At this point in chapter 2, there is no woman. There is just Adam. There's no, there's no woman, there's no Eve, there's no... I mean, that's not there yet. So I want you to understand that when God gave the commandment at Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, he said, you can eat of the tree of the knowledge. He says, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll surely die. You are not allowed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is the commandment of God. You can eat out of every tree, but there is one tree in this garden that you cannot eat of because if you do, you will surely die. Now let's let's explain some points out of this. One, Adam is the only one currently in the garden with God. So Adam's the one that knows that you can't eat of this tree. There's no woman yet. That's an ex, that's a distinctive point we need to get to later, and we're gonna see how this impacts chapter three. The next part of this is I want you to see that. There is both of the trees in the garden and God telling him not to do it. Now, people have asked over the years, why did God put a tree of knowledge of good and evil if God didn't want Adam to eat of it? Like, why, why is there even an option? Well, that's what's called love. Love does not force you to do anything. Love doesn't say you have to choose me and I'm your only option. Love gives an option. Love gives an option. Because... If, if, it, if there was no option to say no, or if there wasn't an option to choose differently, then it's not real love. Real love gives you the choice. That's something important you want to see. The third thing I want you to see is that thou, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, this is going to get a little ahead of ourselves, but I want to make sure that you see this. Surely die. Adam lived like another 900-something years. 
after the after chapter three. So his body didn't die. His mind didn't die either. And we're going to get to this, but Adam named the animals and he named woman Eve after the sin. Okay? So I know that's jumping way ahead, but I want you to see this. What dies when you participate out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What happened to Adam and Eve, or Adam and woman technically, but Adam when he took part of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is his spirit died. His relationship and connection with God, that's what your spirit is what died. That's why it says that you must get born again. And being born again is talking about your spirit. Your spirit conjoined with the Holy Spirit. You are one spirit with the exclusion of another. Which means your spirit and the Holy Spirit come together and it gets born again. That's your connection to God. So if Adam takes part of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, his spirit or connection with God will die. That's what God is saying right here. And there's the other implication that you will physically die too, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. So let's look at verses 18 through 20. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. For out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. So what was God doing when he created the animals? This is a powerful point to know. God was making Adam a help meet. God formed the animals for Adam. God was also allowing Adam to name all the animals. Because God delegated, Genesis 126, dominion of the earth to Adam. The heavens, even the heavens are the earth, but or the the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he gave to the children of men. I believe that's in Psalm 115. I might be off on that, but I think it's 115 verse 14. But, and, and like I said, that verse might be off a little bit. But what I'm saying is, God was making a helpmeet for Adam. So the first thing I want you to see is that animals were given to men. The, the whole point of, uh, we need to be, you know, you shouldn't abuse animals. Because they were given to men from God. God created them for you. But you also shouldn't put animals on a pedestal like there, there are religions that worship animals, think that their ancestors might be animals, and I'm not being disrespectful to anybody, but that's just crazy, because those animals were created for you. Not to be above you, not to be equal with you, but for you, to help you. Okay? But what's here is this thing. Was any creature found to be Adam's helpmeet? No. No animal was found to be a helpmeet for Adam, which shows... That there is nothing that an animal can do to be a helpmeet for you. Animals cannot be a helpmeet. That's something powerful to understand. Animals cannot be a helpmeet. Which also means, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this with all the love that I have, pets are not a substitute for people. They are not. Not in any aspect, anywhere, anytime. I know there is plenty of people that would that would run $10,000 in credit card debt, that would go to the ends of the earth for their dog. But if it meant that you had to open your mouth and speak the name of Jesus to your coworker, they wouldn't do it. They would rather their coworker burn in hell, even though that's not what they're saying, that's what they're doing, over their, over their own pet. There is no pet, no cat, no dog, no animal in your house that is a substitute for people. According to the word of God, animals are not a help me. They are not the people would rather spend time with their dog than other people. That's selfish in my opinion. I know this is a pretty bold thing to say, but I, I stand very firm on this. It is selfish to think that there are, there are people going to hell and dying not knowing Jesus every day, but it's more important that you take care of your dog instead of witnessing to other people. I don't agree with that. I and mean, this, this church will never agree with that. Um, I just want to make that clear. I know that's not going to be a, <laughs> a very popular opinion, 
but the word of God is very clear that when God created every living creature, every animal that's on the earth, there was not found a help meet for Adam. None of them were, none of them could do the job that another person could. People are the only people that can be help meets for each other. Animals cannot be. Let's keep going before, before I offend some more people. Because <laughs> these, these points are pretty, pretty blatant. But let's read the next part. We're going to go to Genesis 2, 21 through 25. And the Lord, caused, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. Okay, so this is the last section before we go into chapter 3. So let's, uh, let's answer some of these questions. What did God do for Adam after he named every creature? Now, God put Adam to sleep to make woman. He caused the deep sleep to fall upon him. God made Adam a helpmeet directly from his own person. Now, I want you to see this. The Lord God, it was God's decision, it was God's idea to bring a helpmeet directly out of him. So people always talk about, you know, what about my husband? What about my wife? What about my spouse? And I, I always tell people, God is the one from the very beginning, when there wasn't even a woman yet, decided that marriage was good. That decided that man needed a woman and woman needed a man. But, but man needed a woman. Man needed a wife. And it came directly out of him. So this is God's plan. So if you're ever wondering, you know, does God want me to get married or, or, you know, all of these different things, just understand it was God's plan first for marriage. If God wanted you to be alone with your 10 cats, God would have not done this in the first, first two chapters of the Bible. But in the second chapter of the Bible, God decided that for man, it would be a woman. Now, this is also a good point to understand right here. God did not create two men. Homosexuality is not in the plan of God. God is 100% against that. And we will learn that in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah and, and all these different things where men cleaving unto men, and it, it's what caused the civil war in Egypt or in uh, Israel in the book of Judges. You might think it's because of the, the concubine. It, it's partially because of the concubine, but it's because they were coming after the Levite. I don't have time to go into that today. But man and woman was the only intention of God from the very beginning. Now, God made Adam a helpmeet directly from his own person. So, what did Adam name the person that was formed from his rib? He called her woman. Which is Strong's H802 Isa, which is woman, wife, or female. He called her his wife. That's what she was called in the beginning before she was named Eve so I want you to know this she was not named Eve until afterwards and we're gonna see that in chapter 3 but I just want you to know her name was woman why is it important to know what Adam called her it's the same position of authority as Adam now that might throw some of you off because you might not have ever heard somebody say that when Adam called her woman or bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, he delegated the same authority he had from God in Genesis 1.26 to her. He gave her his authority. Adam didn't put Eve or woman under him. She's named Eve later, so we'll just use her name. But he didn't put her under him. He put her at equal position with him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day they were created. That's Genesis 5-2. They were both called Adam because they were both delegated the same authority from God. Man and woman. There is not, there, 
God's intentional plan from the beginning is males and females to have the same exact position of authority together. That's why I say if you can do the job, you can do the job. We don't delegate position based off sex. Let's keep going. And God said, let us make man in our own in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over everything creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth Genesis 126 it's the same authority so what happens when two people are joined together they become one flesh they become one flesh their souls are tied together we are the same so did Adam and the woman have any garments on? They were naked. That's Strong's H6174 Armin. It means naked or bare. So they were naked or bare. But what I want you to see is in Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 2. And then I beheld and lo a likeness as the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins even downward fire. From his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. The Lord, as in the book of Ezekiel, from his loins downward is fire, from his loins upward is fire. So is the similitude of the Lord God of Israel. God is clothed in fire. That fire is the Shekinah glory fire. It's the same fire that Moses saw in the bush, the fire that doesn't consume. Adam was clothed in the same fire. Let's make man in our own image and our own likeness. Adam was clothed in the same fire that God was clothed in. So was woman. They were clothed in the Shekinah glory of God. The reason why they didn't know they were naked, they were both naked and not ashamed, is because they didn't see the nakedness of their skin. They saw the Shekinah glory of God on them. They saw the fire on them, so they didn't actually see the naked barrenness of them. This is important to know. That Adam and Eve saw themselves through the fire of God. And that fire of God is what brings people to not be ashamed. In the New Testament, you're clothed in the blood of Jesus, which causes you to not be ashamed. But in the Old Testament, in, in, in the original plan of God, it was God himself, his fire that clothed us. So God's intentional plan, even from the beginning. And I want you to see these little details. It's the intentionality of how God designed it from the beginning. If you can understand how God designed it, you can understand why certain things are the way they are. God created them on purpose for specific reasons. God's intentionality is that you be clothed with God. And if you're clothed with Him, you see yourself the way He sees you. You see yourself through Him. It's the same thing in the book of Galatians chapter 3 verse 27. We are baptized into Christ. For those that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, no Jew or Greek, no, no male, no female. We are all clothed in the glory of God. That's also why woman had the same delegated position of authority. When Adam called her woman, wife, female, he delegated, a, one, a different sex, but two, he put her in the same position. From the beginning, God's plan is males and females to be equal. For marriage to be between a male and a female only. That's, these, are, these are things that God intended from the beginning. Because God created them, he is the only one that has the right to say how it's going to be. He's the creator of it, so he has the right to say this is how this works. Same thing with car manufacturers and, and any type of manufacturer. They make a product, and then they give you an owner's manual. They say this is how it works because this is how it works effectively. This is how you fix things, but this is the plan. Male, female, marriage, that's it, period. And, and it's male, female, same position of authority. This is what redemption brought, is males and females to have the exact same position of authority. We don't believe males are over females. We don't believe that husbands are over wives. In, in the sense of leading, yes, but in the sense of God's eyes for perspective on authority, you're the same. 
the same. You become one flesh. And when you see her as bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, you treat her the exact same way that Christ would treat you. You treat her with equalness. It changes the way marriage is seen. It changes the way perspective is seen in the body of Christ. That we're not lording over through positions of authority, but we are, we are coming equal together. That's all I want to spend on that right now. We're going to keep going. We have a, a lot more to get through. This is a, a point break. We are going into chapter 3. Into chapter 3, we're going through verse by verse in chapter 3. There is a total of 20... Twenty-four verses in Genesis chapter three. The last three we're going to put together because they need to be put together. A couple of these are together, but most of them are separate. And we are about to go through all of these verses one by one, and we are going to see exactly what happened. I want to talk about exactly what happened in chapter three. I don't want to talk about what we think we know happened. I don't want to talk about what the church has taught us for years happened. I want to look verse by verse at what actually happened in the Garden of Eden. I want to know what happened because if you know what happened, you can also see one, the trick of the enemy, but you can too see the heart of the Father. So if you need to take a break at all, please hit the pause button, take a break, and when you come back, we're going to go right into chapter three in the Garden of Eden. All right, church, here we go into chapter three. Chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, what I want you to see is that the devil approached the woman with what a question of what God had said. Now, some people believe that this was an actual serpent. And what you'll know later on is that this, when the serpent gets cursed, he, have to eat, he has to crawl on his belly. So serpents actually stood upright. You know, we're talking about snakes. Snakes stood upright. But he's more subtle. Now, this could be a, a picture description that, you know, the subtlety, you know, he because um, the devil was an angel of light, so he's not ugly. I mean, he's, he was beautiful. I mean, he, he was, he, we don't have time to go into that today. But what I want you to see is there's some people that teach that this is, just a figurative serpent it, it's a description of how the devil operates now that could be the case it could be talking about that he comes in his angelic form because he was an archangel in heaven he comes in his angelic form and then is just crafty and subtle like a serpent as a serpent slithers now i don't know if that's completely correct or if he came in the exact form of a serpent either way it doesn't necessarily matter um, to get the point, both of them would be correct. I think if you took that figuratively, as he came as an angel, but he was subtle like a serpent. But you got to remember, serpents didn't go on the ground until later on in chapter 3. So it would be standing upright. I believe this is dealing with an actual animal, especially when you see the curse of God later. So, but what I also want you to see is, the question is, hath God said... Now, one of, the, one of the number one main attacks of the devil against you and against your life is to question what God said. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he was tempted on accordance with what God's word had said. The devil knows God's words. The devil knows the Bible. And he will twist and bend. And he will use things because he's subtle, he's crafty, he's smart. To try to get you off of what God had said to do. Now, I also want you to see that the devil approached the woman. The devil didn't approach Adam. Now, you might say, why is that such a big deal? Because you got to remember in chapter 2, I told you, don't forget. When God told, and we're going to see this in just a second. When God told Adam, you should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or you will surely die, woman was not formed yet. Adam hadn't had his rib taken out. So, and, and we'll go ahead and read verse 2 and 3 and then we'll tie these both together. And the woman said unto the serpent, 
we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The woman's reply to the enemy was what God spoke to Adam in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. How did woman know this? In the Bible, it does not say that God ever spoke to woman about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God only spoke to Adam. Now, there's a couple craftiness of the enemy that I want to I want to bring forth here. One, what you hear secondhand from somebody else about God is going to be one of the number one things the devil comes after you with. You say, oh, I've read the Bible. I know the Bible. Okay, I believe you. But if you say, well, Pastor Cody said this, the devil is more inclined to attack you in that area because you don't know what the Word says. You haven't read your Bible. And that puts you in a deep place of being a... I mean, you open yourself up for the attack from the enemy because the enemy is coming against you and he is going to try to steal the Word out of you. And if you haven't heard directly from God, you're more inclined to, to be succumb to the attack. So the devil's coming against the character of God, questioning what God said. And then in, in this verse 2 to 3, I want you to see that the woman replied to the devil what God had spoke to Adam. Now, here is something that we need to know. The Bible says to not flee from sin. It doesn't say flee from sin. It says flee from the appearance of sin. If it even looks bad, you flee from it. You don't, you don't get all the way to the edge and then try to back off. You're more inclined to fall if you're on the edge versus a mile back from the cliff. Amen. I hope you got that. It's flee from the appearance of evil. She is interacting in a conversation with the devil. This is one of the worst things you could do. It says resist the devil. Flee. He will flee from you. Flee from the appearance of evil. Do not even start to have the conversation. You start interacting. You start contemplating in your mind, which is exactly what we're going to see next, is you start interacting with the devil on his terms. He starts twisting things. You go, oh, maybe. And then the next thing you know, you're contemplating sin or falling into sin. If the enemy comes at you, you speak what God speaks, you rebuke the enemy, and you flee. Adam and Eve had dominion. Genesis 126, God gave man dominion. They hadn't turned it over yet. She hadn't sinned. She had the option. Everything on the earth submitted to the authority of Adam and Eve, or woman technically because she wasn't named Eve yet. They had authority over the serpent. It had to obey what they said. But instead of rebuking, also protecting their job was to dress and keep, not only to serve in the garden, but to keep it, to guard it from this. But they didn't exercise dominion or authority over it. They decided to start kind of playing with it. It's one of the worst things you can do with sin. It's not rebuking, standing against, fighting it, waging war against it. As you start having the conversation with it. When the attack comes... You resist it, he flees from you, and you you just don't entertain it, church. Don't entertain it. Verses 4 to 5, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know, and that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, let me crack my Bible open, and I want to read something to you. Chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Out of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. It, God never said anything about your eyes being open and you gaining and you knowing good and evil. God didn't talk about that. I want you to see this. The devil's attack against them was for them to go farther than what God had intended. Knowing good and evil. 
Now this is the part about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil is telling her lies that she will not die, but she's enticing her. He's enticing her with the lust for knowledge and power. It's one of the, it's one of the great the great faults of man. It, and, and I'm not saying faults in that aspect. I'm saying like this is what the enemy attacks us with is this lust for knowledge and power. God never told Adam that he wouldn't make him wise or make him with, you know, have more knowledge. God was saying, just don't eat of it. And, and part of this is because without the knowledge of good and evil, you live in innocence. The knowledge of good and evil is what's called consciousness. So let's go on to the next verse, and then we're going to tie this in. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. That's the part I want you to see. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat so the woman transgressed the command of God and ate and gave to Adam now here's the part you need to see Adam did not keep the garden of Eden at that moment it was his job to protect it and he was standing right beside her while this was happening having the knowledge of good and evil makes one wise to be able to discern what to do in different situations Knowing what to do is what takes you out of grace and puts you under the law. It's what pulls you out of innocence. They, the, a lot of Bible scholars call what Adam was in or woman was in before sin was the dispensation of innocence. They didn't know right and wrong. They didn't have a consciousness. I'm talking consciousness like church. Everybody knows what's right and what's wrong. Now you can sear your conscience to where you just don't care anymore. But it, from the very beginning, you know right and you know wrong. It's part of what happened in the Garden of Eden. This is why it talks about in Galatians that your conscience will bear witness either while excusing or else excusing you. Accusing while, while it's excusing you. When it's talking about your conscience being a law unto itself. Because you without the law can still be a law to yourself because you know right and wrong. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't know what was right and what was wrong. They lived in this innocence of free grace. But when they ate, the wisdom is the application of knowledge. It's understanding right and wrong. It's where you choose to now pull yourself out of living freely in innocence and grace of God. And now you have to choose or work. The work mentality of right and wrong, do and don't, all of this is what was birthed in the Garden of Eden. This was not in man until Adam and Eve sinned, or Adam and woman sinned. Chapter 3, verse 7. Let's keep going. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So the glory of God left them when shame came from sin, realizing in that moment they were naked. They then tried to atone for sin trying to receive a covering again and clothe themselves with fig leaves and aprons. There's a lot we could talk about here, but their eyes being open is their eyes now seeing through the lens of right and wrong, pulling them out of grace, out of innocence. When the blood of Jesus covers you and get born again, what it does is it washes your conscience from dead works so that you don't see yourself as this right here is seen, as naked, the Shekinah left. They no longer saw themselves through the glory of God. They saw themselves as themselves and how they could work and earn. It's one of the greatest, I mean, this is the greatest fall of man. I mean, it is the fall of man. That's why it's Adam falling in the garden. What pulled people out of walking with God and cooled the day. This nakedness is them now seeing themselves without the clothing of God because now they're in sin. It's the shame that comes on. They sewed fig leaves together. It is This is always what man tries to do when man falls, is try to work and atone or put a covering on themselves to try to make themselves right. If you remember, I, I believe, in Mark chapter 11, when, when Jesus curses the fig tree before he goes to the cross, this is this whole point, that the fig leaves 
what what the tree did to try to be a covering, that's why Jesus cursed it later. Jesus had to come against the thing that tried to be a covering for man at the beginning. I don't have time to go into that today. I just want you to see that. But they were making themselves coverings. The tree wasn't meant to be a covering. The tree was meant to be for food. Pleasant to the sight and good for food. And now it's trying to be a covering. It's trying to be something that God didn't create it to be. That's why Jesus cursed it later. And you know There was no figs. There were just leaves. We'll talk about that later. I just want you to see that. But I want you to see that when sin comes, the shame and the accusation and the condemnation and the guilt, what it will try to do is get you to try to atone for sin out of your own flesh by you doing something to cover yourself. Verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So I want you to see this. Fear caused Adam and his wife to hide. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. God was still in the garden, walking in the cool of the day. It's because of shame and guilt they hid. Sin caused Adam and his wife to separate themselves from God. Now I want you to see this. Sin does not cause God to pull away from you. Sin causes you to draw back from God. It's important to know because a lot of a lot of believers believe, oh, I committed sin, now God's left me. God is walking in the cool of the day, even after Adam sinned. He's still in the garden. And God is omniscient. He knows all things. And he's omnipresent, so he's everywhere. But what I want you to know is that in the sovereignty of God, now there's a big misunderstanding on sovereignty. The will of God versus what actually happens. Most people think that it's, if it's always God's will, then it always happens. If God wants me to know, he'll tell me. If God, I mean, there's a lot of... I don't want to go into this today because we don't have time to really break this sacred cow down. But I want to, I'll give you a quick explanation. It's the will of God that all people be saved. But not everybody gets saved. There's people that go to hell every day. It's the will of God for them to stay in the garden in the cool of the day. God's plan from the beginning was intimate deep relational fellowship with man in the garden that was his plan but his will like his will allows man to have free choice it's the free will of man that causes that when man messed up and it sinned caused him to draw back from the relationship the drawing back the separation did not come because of God it came because of man and that's one thing I want you to see is that in the new covenant and in grace, one of the greatest things you can know is that if you see yourself as God sees you, which they didn't, they saw themselves naked and clothed themselves, they saw themselves dirty, they lived dirty, they drew back. When you start to see yourself at the way God sees you, even in your immaturity, even in your weakness, you don't draw back from him, you push into him. But Adam and Eve drew back. Verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? I want to see God is still going after Adam even after sin was committed. Still going after him. Verse 10, And he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. So Adam is acknowledging fear is the, being the reason why he drew back. I was afraid. That's what's causing separation. Fear of understanding how God is going to deal with a situation in the midst of your shortcoming is one of the greatest. It's one of the. It's one of the. First John four eighteen. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Fear causes this torment in our life, because it causes us to not know the heart and nature and character of God. It causes us to draw back. It's, it's you hear God and you know his glory and you see your weakness and instead of going into him to find your worth, you draw back in fear. Fear is the great, it's the greatest tool of the enemy. There is faith, which is connection to God, or there's fear, which is the belief in what the enemy says about you. It causes torment. 
causes you to be tormented. That's what Adam was dealing with. He's being separated. Adam was alone with God. Adam and God were alone, and he named every animal. How many animals do we know of? Adam and God together, and God made an animal, and Adam named it. I mean, this deep, intimate relationship. And then fear caused this immense separation from two people that were together in the cool of the day. This is powerful. What fear can do in your life to cause you to separate from God. Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now God is confronting Adam about why he's fearful and he's confronting him about his sin. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree what I told you not to do? The Holy Spirit's job is to convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we don't have time to go into this, but the sin is a singular sense of the one sin of not trusting in God, of not believing in Jesus. The righteousness is your right standing with God. Judgment is judgment of the enemy. But what I want you to see is that the presence of God is to bring you back to Him. That's the Holy Spirit's job is to convict you of this sin that brings you back to Him. God is doing this right now. It's the sin of not trusting and believing how I would respond to you even in the midst of your shortcomings. And we're about to see in a minute that the next couple things are very mistaught. And this is why people don't really know the nature and the character and the heart of the Father. It's because of this misunderstanding that we're about to look at next. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now he confesses, I did eat, that he sinned. And it's because of the help meat that God gave him. So now he's, he's pushing blame. I think part of this is the, you know... People talk about, oh, Adam just blamed Eve. I, I do see that, that where he's shoving it off, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I think it's more, we see that Adam confesses sin. And he says why he did it. It's because this helped me. I, 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 you know, we can talk about this all day long. Was he blaming God because God's the one that made the help me. I don't know if that's necessarily the case, especially because God and Adam were very intimate, very close. They, they had a deep relationship even before woman. So I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I, I do want you to know in verse 12, the, the, main, the main point of verse 12 is to understand Adam confesses sin. And he tells why he did, because the woman gave it to him. So we see a confession made. I want you to see that there's a confession made. Verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is that that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I, and I did eat. So, God confronts the woman. She does confess her sin. She said, I did eat. But before she said, I eat, she said that the devil, the serpent, beguiled her. Now, this word beguiled is Strong's H5377 Nasa. It means to beguile or to deceive. The woman's saying, The devil deceived me. Now, after, after God confronts, so they hide, they, they fig leaves, hide, God calls out, confession, confession, and now in verse 14. Now, verse 14 forward, we see judgments of God. And I want you to understand, and I want you to really pay attention to these judgments. Very closely, I want you to pay attention to this. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou, hast, thou art cursed above all cattle, above all beasts of the field, Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So I do want you to see that. That this animal, that's why I believe it's an actual serpent, not a figurative, is because above all the cattle, beasts of the field. It, it, it's a comparison between other animals. So that's why I believe this is a comparison of animals. After the confession, the first thing that God does, he confronts Adam, he confesses, he confronts Eve, she confesses. The very next thing that God does is not judge man. It's not what happens next. The very first thing God does when his children have messed up is he curses the enemy for the deception that he did against them. That's powerful. God's first act was to curse the devil. I want you to see that. The, and, I, and, I, and animals can be possessed. We see that 
throughout the Bible, so I believe that the devil was using the animal. But I want you to see that the first thing God does is confront the evil and curse it. God's heart is to protect his people, and now there's things that are about to happen we're about to see, but I want you to see that the very first thing that God does was not get mad at you. It was to curse the enemy for deceiving, for the deception, for even coming after you. If you see this, you will see a father who loves you that you will run to, that will protect you, that will fight the enemy. What Jesus did was destroy the works of the devil. He did not come here to punish you. Jesus came to set you free from the devil. And if you see this, when the attack comes, you won't submit to the attack. You'll run and hide. You'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And he, you'll, you'll be protected from him. And the, and the Lord God will fight the battle for you. So I just want you to see that. Verse 14 is the, the curse on the devil. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's 3.15. Now listen, we still don't have a judgment against man or woman. Not yet. Even before that, verse 15, before judgment on Adam and the woman, God prophetically speaks the promise of Jesus, which is showing that God is always making the provision before the need. Before you ever had whatever need you have right now, God has made the provision available before the need. It's one of the, it's one of the greatest promises you'll ever know in the Bible. And it's in chapter 3, and most people don't ever teach it, but you need to know this. The promise, the provision is made available before the need. Before God ever executes judgment, before God ever puts them out of the garden, before anything like that against man and woman, God speaks the promise into play. The provision is always made available before the need. Verse 16, and, he, and unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In thy sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now the punishment is that the woman was to have childbearing pain. And now her desire is to her husband, and he is to rule over her. You got to remember, Adam said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I will call you woman. And then when they were created, they were both called Adam. But the woman, part of her punishment was to go down. That was part of the punishment of woman. So women, if you want to ask the question, it was Eve that caused that. So this, this dimension of power dynamic between males and females in our culture is not anything but a curse. It's the curse from the garden. It's the punishment in the garden. So if everybody gets born again, we all come back to the same playing field. When you're born again, you should be on the same playing field. Let me rephrase this. You are on the same playing field when you're born again. We're all sons of God. We're all the bride of Christ. But because of what happened in the garden, this power dynamic shift between males and females, that's what happened. So I want you to see that, that... People want to talk like, oh, it's, it's the culture, and it's things you've done, and it's just males being mean. No, the dynamic is actually on the inside of women to have somebody rule over them. It's that sin nature. Your sin nature will cause you to want to submit to somebody, even if they're evil to you. If you look at people that are going through domestic violence and abuse cases and things like that, there's women that will stay in those positions for years. Even, I mean... To the point they're getting beat on a regular basis. And you say, why won't you leave? It's because the sin nature of man will cause her to cleave unto her husband. To have somebody to rule over her. Even if it's negative. That's why we need to get born again. That's why we need to share the gospel. Because the gospel pulls woman out of that. And puts her at the same playing field with man. It's powerful. I just wanted you to see that. And that's this... When you approach people and you have these conversations of people that are going through, and those are terrible situations, 100% terrible situations. But the way to get out of that is not counseling. It's not even getting them out because they'll be, they'll, there's a lot of them that go back. There's a lot of women that go back to very terrible situations. And you say, why do you keep going back? Well, the answer is it's the sin nature. It's, it's, it's the curse on woman. It's the punishment on woman from the garden. 
that needs to be delivered through the atonement and the blood of Jesus. You need to share the gospel. Get them born again. Get them taught the word of God. It's the only way to free them. It's the only way to set them free. So in verse 17 through 19, now we're going to look at what Adam had, what, what the punishment to Adam was. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and how hast eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And sorrow shalt thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now cursed, God curses the ground, punishes man. Was the, the punishment for man was to eat of the ground all the days of thy life. And we're going to look at this in just a little bit. But in Revelation chapter 22, the tree of life, the tree they could have stayed in in the garden, produces 12 manner of fruit every month. It's not a work. You just go and pick the fruit and eat. The whole point of this is to say that the ground got cursed. Now you have to toil. Now you have to come out of the innocence, out of the grace that was free, and now you have to work. I want you to see that because I also want you to know that the earth groaned and travailed in pain till the sons of God be revealed. The earth is still waiting on the sons of God to be revealed because the earth is has this punishment of thorns and thistles that it's going to bring forth. The ground got cursed. And Adam now has to work. And I don't see, now he has to work all the days of his life to be able to survive instead of living in the blessing. It's, he's removed from grace and put into work. And the redemption in the New Testament is to be delivered from the work and brought back into grace. It's the glory of what Jesus did on that cross. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now I want you to see, this is Genesis 3.20. Adam calls his wife name Eve because she's the mother of all living. Adam names his wife Eve. He changes her name from woman. She is no longer woman meaning bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She's now called Eve, which is Strong's H2332, Hala, uh, Hua, Eve. It means life or living. What I want you to see is the difference, not necessarily the, the, the part about the name, but I want you to see the shift. That she wasn't Eve at a different dynamic than Adam when she sinned. She was at the same position now she will cleave, she will, she will seek to be under authority to man because of what she did in the garden, and then Adam names her Eve. That's powerful. I, just, I want you to see that, that this is, this is the problem with sin. Sin causes these things to occur and happen that causes a lie, I mean, things to happen throughout your entire life because of this, consequences of sin. Verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, let's read this. God sheds blood from animals to pay for sin and clothe them with animal skins. You can't clothe them with skins unless you kill the animal. Now, and almost all things by the law are purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. That's Hebrews 9.22. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged would have no more consciousness of sin. The blood that was clothed, when they got clothed in animal skins, the fig leaves are gone, the animal skins are on, and there's blood shed, that paid for that sin. But the problem, the reason why it wasn't eternal, the reason why they couldn't stay in the garden, we'll see this in a second, it's because it wouldn't purge that consciousness from works mentality to back to grace. That was only done through what Jesus did because his blood is the only thing that can purify or purge the conscience from dead works. They still had consciousness of sin because they still had consciousness of right and wrong. They still lived under that mentality so it would happen again. But that sin initially had to be paid for so God clothed animal skin, shed blood. I want you to see that. It was God that shed blood. It was him taking the step to pay for sin. Just like God sent Jesus in the New Testament to pay for sin. God always making the move to man. I don't, I just want, I don't want you to miss that. God in the whole beginning wasn't, 
It's not, I'm mad and I never want to see you again, shove you out of the garden and go die. That's not God's heart. Even before he puts him out of the garden, he's making ways back to himself over and over and over. I prophetically speak Jesus. I curse the, I curse the devil. I prophetically speak Jesus. I shed blood. Like God's doing all these things to show his intentionality of wanting to be in relationship with man. I just don't want you to miss that. Let's read these last couple verses. And the Lord God said, Behold, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden Shebrams and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So God sent man out of the garden of Eden so it would not be able to touch the tree of life. God is acknowledging that man now has a consciousness to know the difference between right and wrong. God places a, an angel to guard the way of the tree of life. Now, I ask people all the time, I say, why did God put Adam and Eve out of the garden? I've asked that question for months and months, for years, actually. People say, oh, God was mad. Nope. People say, it was sin. Nope. That wasn't it. Remember, God clothed them with animal skin. He shed blood. It's not the sin that's the reason why God put them out of the garden. The reason God answers himself, because man has become one to know, because, behold, the man has become as one of us. And who's he talking to? I believe he's talking to the Godhead and also the angels too, probably. To know good and evil. The reason why I'm putting you out is because you have a consciousness. And here's the thing. Lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him from the garden. Because you know right and wrong, you will inevitably sin again. Because you're out of the dispensation of innocence. Because you know right and wrong, you are going to go under this works mentality. I can't let you touch the tree of life. Now, the way I've taught this for, for years is, if you, if you eat of the tree of life, you'll live forever. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll surely die. And, and that dying is the separation because your spirit dies. Not, not the physical death, but the, the spiritual death. This is the way I, I've taught it for years. Is that you eat of this tree and you surely die and you live forever, then you will live forever in your death. Or you will live forever separated from God. Hear the heart of God behind that. I'm putting you out so you're not forever living in separation from me. That shows that I want to be in relationship with you. This is intense mercy. This is intense mercy. This is great love. But there's also a deeper connection in that, is that if you can't die, who can't die? Jesus. It takes death of blood to remit sins. If Jesus couldn't die because they could eat the tree of life and live forever, then there would never be any atonement for sin. There would never be a way to die so Jesus could die on the cross and bring us back to God. There's a greater plan behind this. It's not that I'm mad and I never want to be in relationship with you anymore. It's I love you so much I have to put you out. Because if I don't put you out, then you'll, you'll eat of that tree of life. You'll live forever in death, in separation from me, and I'll never have you. I have to put you out. This is mercy. This is love. And people miss that heart of God all the time. So I want to read through. I want to give an outline. There's 21 points right here. I'm going to go through them kind of quick. And then, because we got one more thing I want to look at, I want to look at that tree of life and explain what I just said some more. So, outline verse one Devil questions the authority of God's word. Point two The woman replies to the devil, acknowledging the commandment of God told to her by Adam. Don't miss that. Verse uh, point three The devil lies to deceive her using her own lust for knowledge and power. Uh, four, Adam does not protect the garden from the serpent. Five, the woman takes of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and eats. Six, woman gives to Adam and he eats. Seven, their eyes are open when they receive knowledge, taking them out of grace. Eight, they try to clothe themselves with fig and leaves and aprons out of shame. Nine, in fear they separate themselves from God and, and when they hide. Ten, God calls out to Adam. 11. Adam acknowledges that fear that caused him to hide. 12. God confronts him about sin. 13. Adam confesses. 14. God confronts woman and she confesses. 15. 
God executes punishment, curse, and judgment on the devil. Don't miss that. 16, God prophetically speaks Jesus. 17, punishment for woman. 18, punishment for Adam. 19, Adam names Eve. 20, God atones for sin. 21, God sends them out of the garden to protect the tree of life. What is the heart of the Father? To have relationship with man and to make a way back to the tree of life. I don't think we have, we don't have this in our lesson, but if you read just a few chapters later, I believe it's in uh, Genesis 18, it says that God sat with Abraham in the heat of the day outside of the tent door with two angels right before God goes and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham sits with God and pleads for Lot in a full-blown conversation. You can go read it. I think it's chapter 18. So we're talking 15 chapters later in the Bible, and God is still having relationship with man. And I, and I just want you to see that, that God was not putting them out because he didn't want to be in a relationship. It's, I love you so much, I have to protect the tree of life. Because the end goal... Why did God kick them out of the garden? Is that in sin, if they touched the tree of life, they would live forever in sin and never be able to be in relationship with God again. There would never be a way for eternal life with God. But the other part of that that we're going to read in just a second, let's go into Revelation 22. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, there was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. What two things does the tree of life do? Twelve manner of fruit every month. The leaves are for the tree for the healing of the nation. Where is the tree of life in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ? He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. It's on the side of the water. Why is it important to know what the benefits are in the tree of life? It explains what God did, what he did in Genesis 3. And the question is, has your understanding now changed to the true heart of God? So, I'm going to summarize chapter 2 and chapter 3. And I'm going to give you the heart of God one more time. Because I don't want you to miss this. God wanted to share his love with, with somebody, with man. The God of eternity of past, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, love demands to be shared. That's what true love does. It, it shares so God creates man to be in relationship with him in the cool of the day. Realizes he needs to help me. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Adam is a man. He's physical. So God is like, let's make him a help me. No animal could do it. So God makes him woman. Adam names her woman because she's in the same position. And then the the... The, the fall comes in chapter 3. The devil deceives the woman. Adam doesn't protect the garden. That's the greatest sin because his job was to dress and to keep it. Your job is to protect it. And he didn't do his job. He willfully disobeyed a commandment of God. Adam could have obeyed and Eve could have done what she did. Or woman could have done what she did. But that's not what happened. Adam fell. The Shekinah glory left. They saw themselves naked and bare. They tried to atone for sin by themselves by covering. And then God confronts them. It's fear that caused Adam. It's shame. God didn't draw back from him. He drew back from God. After the confrontation, acknowledging sin, God curses the devil. The first thing God does is curse the enemy. Don't miss that. Before God does anything, he wages war and curses the devil for what he did to his creation. God loves you so much. He didn't talk to you first. He cursed that devil. The devil's a liar. God loves you. Then he speaks Jesus. Before he ever deals with you about your sin, he prophetically speaks the promise. He prophetically speaks the way out, back to himself. He is making a way. The provision of God is always available before the need. And then he deals with it. She, the woman takes now a lesser position. It's, it's the curse. And, and, and Adam 
the ground's cursed. Now he's got a toil. He can't take from the tree. The tree of life was producing fruit, his food, free. All he had to do was dress it, just serve in it, work the garden. But no, now he's got to till the ground. In the sweat of thy brow thou shalt eat bread. Now you're going to have to work for everything you have. And then God sheds blood. He atones for sin. I love that. I love that part. God's intentionality to shed blood and atone for sin and clothe them is prophetic of what Jesus did. God is always making a way. God's heart, the Father's heart, is relationship with you. Don't ever miss that. His heart is to be with you. And he does what's needed to make that the case. And after the prophetic of Jesus, after the clothing of the animal skins, Adam names woman. God, we bless these sirens. We pray for wherever they're going, for the firefighters and for everybody. Be blessed. Angels go with them. We pray for healing, deliverance, the uh, presence of the Holy Ghost, and the protection of angels. In Jesus' name, amen. But what I want you to see is when God puts them out of the garden, he puts them out because I have to protect the tree of life. For two reasons. One, if you eat of that tree, you'll live forever in sin, and I'll never get to have a relationship with you. But the second part is I can't send my son to die for you if you can't die. The tree of life will keep you from dying because you'll live forever. So I have to make sure death is on the earth so that Jesus can die to make a way back to eternal life. It's the heart of God to be in relationship with man. And I just want you to see that. See God through the love lens, not the law lens. If you see him as the God of love that loves you and wants to be with you and wants to be in relationship with you, it will change your entire perspective and dynamic on who the Father is. So our lesson's done today, church. If you have questions, class, if you have questions, please reach out. Uh, topic number 14 is next week. I don't remember what that one is, but we will do topic number 14 next week. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you. Pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let this word come alive. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Class, have a wonderful week this week. All of the resources will be on our website here momentarily. Have a great day.